I uh, got to a point where um, uh, I thought I could play the game, but um, it was my friends and, and the guys that I played with that made me look good. And then when we got to, uh, they got graded into the under 23s, I think it was back then. Um, and I was uh, trialling for the Jersey flag side and I got cut out of that squad. And um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do and was fortunate enough to bump into an old coach of mine who convinced me to referee. When I say convinced me, it took him a little while because um, as a cheeky little halfback, I, I wasn't um, the referee's best friend. But um, got me on the field and it was the best thing I've ever done. I fell in love with it from the minute that I sort of got involved from the first time I went out there and, and, and refereed. It was something that I thought, without you know, sounding conceited or anything, I thought, this is something that I might be good at. This is something I might be able to, you know, to pursue and, and take a little bit further. Um, when I first started refereeing, there was no option to be a full-time referee. So it wasn't ever going to be a job. It was a hobby and it was something that, um, it was, it, for me, it was more something that I wanted to succeed in something that I just wanted to take it to as far as I could take it and see how could I could be. It's something I'm, I'm a pretty competitive fella and so um, I just wanted to see, you know, how far I could take it. Um, and like, you know, every other referee that went on to referee first grade around that time, I just then progressed through the systems, you know, which are the systems the same as players through my junior rep career into grade and then fortunate enough, yeah, to, to referee at the NRL and um, been there for, for a long time. Uh, the, the thing with, you know, for me, like I look at my career and, and people look at me and say, you're disappointed because I'm the only referee that's refereed over 300 games and hasn't refereed a grand final, hasn't refereed a state of origin. Um, you know, I, I've been around for a long time and haven't reached the heights of the game. But to me, I look at it as I don't um, see that as, as failure. I see that as success because what it means is that I have other attributes away from what I do on the field that keeps me around. You know, for me, it's around, you know, the way I train. So obviously what I do at training, people like, and it makes, you know, hopefully what I do, I, I try and bring people along and make people better. So I think that's something that's given me longevity. Um, and I think obviously my character and my personality, you know, that keeps me around. Like if I, I don't think I'm good enough, you know, or I'm a 350-game referee, um, but I think that, what I've done outside that has allowed me to be able to stay around that long and, and get those games under my belt. So, yeah, I, I don't think it's talent that's got me there. Um, I, I think it's a lot of luck and, you know, and, and, and persistence and, you know, the things I do off the field, you know, the way I carry myself, the way I train, um, the love I have for what I do. I, I, I love what I do. Um, so more around that stuff. And I talk to a lot of the young junior rep referees now. And, and one of my big things is what we do as referees, we're in a subjective industry, which means we go out, we do our best, but, you know, we don't have a say in, in our career. So, you know, if I'm a sprinter, and I say this a lot, if I'm an athlete, so I'm a sprinter, and I, I go out and I run the 100 metres and I come first, I'm the Olympic champion, you know, I'm the gold medalist, no one can take that away from me. But when I go out and referee, I can go out and referee and have a variance of opinions of how I referee that game. You know, in the same game, you could ask one person and say, that's the best referee I've ever seen. And you'll ask someone else and they said, how you gave that person a ticket? Why are they out there? That was horrendous. So um, when it comes to, you know, then looking at, okay, what do I want to do and how do I want to, you know, what do I want to achieve in this game? It's very hard to sort of go, well, I want, I'm going to base everything I do and my whole life around appointments. Because once you do that, you're only going to get disappointments. Because like I say, it's, no matter how good you train, you know, people always talk about, you know, if you, if you work hard enough at something, the rewards will come. <laughs> that's a lie. That's a lie. To me, that's a lie because I know people that work twice as hard as I have and, 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 and what, you know, unfortunately, they didn't get to succeed and didn't get the referee first grade. Varying factors. So to me, it's about... But my thing is always about just putting yourself and being prepared so that if you do get an opportunity, you're ready to take it. To me, that's more of it around, you know, the refereeing. If you want to be successful, and that means doesn't mean that you want to referee at the NRL level. It might mean that you want to go from refereeing under 14s to under 16s. It might mean you want to go from reserve grade to first grade. You know, it, it could be any of those things. But for me, it's about, you know, I've got to make sure that if the opportunity does come my way, if I get lucky, 
that I'm ready to take that opportunity. And you look at a lot of guys that have you know, gone on to have um, first grade careers or NRL careers, a lot of their opportunities come from luck. It came from someone getting injured. And people say, oh, you were lucky that person got injured and you got out there and, ha- and got a game. But if that person wasn't ready or wasn't prepared, when their opportunity came and went out and made a fool of themselves, their career would have finished before it even started. But they were fortunate enough that they trained hard, they worked hard, they worked on their craft, they took opinions from everybody, they listened to their coaches, and then when their opportunity came, that they were ready to take it. Whether that opportunity came earlier than they thought it would have, or you know, some people it comes, it takes a lot longer than than what they should have. But it's about yeah, making sure that you're prepared and ready to go when that you know when that, when that opportunity does arise. Which sort of takes me into this season, like the season where, you know, 2020 season. And um, for you guys, it's probably worse than for me because I've been fortunate enough that we went two rounds. So I've had some footy this year and I had my trials. Um, and, and, and I was lucky enough to, you know, my pre-season and all that didn't lead to nothing. And then sitting around for four or five months waiting for footy to start. And for me, we have a date and there is some light at the end of the tunnel and we're ready to go. But in saying that, we had six weeks off. So we were given six weeks holidays from when the comp finished um, to when we went back training last week. And I was technically on holidays. If I'd have just gone and, and, and not done anything and sat around um, when we come back to training last week, or they got found out really quickly and then leading into going into round three, you know, I, I wouldn't have been ready to go. So for you guys going forward, the hardest thing in the world for me is training without an end goal without something, you know, I, I train for the weekend um, and not having that. And that's why pre-seasons are so hard. And uh, Going forward now, and especially with restrictions being lifted a little bit over uh, on Friday and going forward, um, you need to start preparing yourself for some footy, whether it be physically and mentally as well, because there's a, a high mental load in what we do. So, you know, especially if long days, so all day Saturdays and some Friday nights and then all day Sundays. Um, there's a high mental load on that. So it's about starting to prepare now. We've sort of got some dates around when our, our, you know, our junior leagues and, and our groups are going to start um, that we're working towards. So now that we sort of have something and, and now that restrictions are starting to be lifted a little bit and we've got opportunities to go out and train in small groups and stuff like that, um, I, I, yeah, I think it's a great opportunity for us to get out there and start to prepare now. Um, I heard when we're waiting to... To sign in, I heard someone um, asking about rule books and stuff, um, which is to me is, is, is was a great question to ask now because now we should be starting to look at you know getting our heads in the rule books and and getting back into footy mode because we've had such a big break and you know, at times we probably thought we weren't going to get back on the field. Quite easy to sort of let it all go in the background and forget about it. So you know we need to start doing that. A lot of the stuff we've been doing at the NRL level is getting our heads back in, into making decisions and rulings because we had. A few new, like we had captain's challenge come up this year for us, which was completely new, and we had two rounds for it. And then we've had this big break, so we're now got to get our heads back around things around, you know, what decisions can captain's challenge when can they challenge um, restarts once you know if challenge uh, uh, upheld and stuff like that. So there's intricacies into that that we needed to make sure that we're prepared going in. And in that six weeks that I had off, it wasn't one of the things that I'd really thought about. You know, I got my head in the rule book. I did all, you know, all my training, but there was the, there were certain, certain little things that I didn't didn't think about, um, which over the last week and a half, I've really had to sort of jump into and make sure that I'm ready to go. So when we go out in the field on the 28th of May, that it just goes back into like it, it, round three just continued from round two. We didn't have a you know three a three months break in between it. So they're the things that you guys need to start doing now. If you know, so that when you when you do go in the the the, the Referees that prepare themselves the best over these next couple of weeks are the ones that are going to get the rewards at the back end of the season. It might not be the same people that have been getting them over the last couple of years because it is such a, you know, a, a strange season and a different season. It's a, you, know, you look at it as an opportunity for you to stand up and, and put your hand up and say, I want to be the one that gets the luck. I want to be the one that's in that position to say, pick me when, when the opportunities come. So to me, that's a, a, yeah, probably the biggest factor going into what you guys need to do over the next couple of weeks before we actually get a definite date and when, when footy's going to start. Um, well, here, Rob, I don't know if you want, if anyone wants to ask any questions or anyone wants anything specific that they want me to, 
to sort of touch on or, or that while um, now instead of waiting for too long and then forgetting what you want to ask and stuff like that. So if anyone's got anything, shoot them at me. Ask so far, guys. I mean, I've got one, Gav, just while I've got yeah. you. Did you have like a mentor or a coach that you had like at a certain point of your career to get you possibly to where you are now? Or did you rely on people to help you or, or just more on watching other referees? Or how do you think you got to where you were um, obviously today? Yeah, for me, I've never really had um, mentors or um you know, people that I sort of went to for my footy. I had, you know, I didn't sort of pick one or two. I had a whole bunch, you know what I mean? I was fortunate enough that when I started and when I started refereeing in South Sydney, there was some really strong A-grade referees around that had come back from grade and were refereeing in A-grade that I got to run touch lines for. So I learned a little bit off them and, you know, seeing how they interacted with their coaches and the information they got. I, I, I listened a lot. I was a big listener. I'm, I'm you know, for, I, I'm not, a person who asks a lot I don't go asking for information and that's just my personality but there are others that are so it's about working out what your personality is and how you get the best of the people around you for me it was listening it was you know I, I, I love rugby league and, and I, you know, I was at a lot of footy so I'd listen and then when I was coming through the grades in junior reps you know you listen to the feedback that other referees were getting um, you know and same through grade and sitting in on, on, on stuff like that so that's that was virtually my my stuff, you know, and just making sure that whenever I heard someone talking about refereeing or talking about even rugby league, I listened. Um, I might have listened to a whole conversation that went for 40 minutes and meant nothing to me and I got nothing out of. But on the flip side of that, I, it might have been a 10-second piece of that 30-minute conversation that makes me better. And anything that makes me better, I'm always looking to, to get hold of. So, yeah, I'm just... I'm, I'm a re- really big listener and observer i sort of watch a lot and, and listen a lot but yeah i know there are others that have had mentors and stuff and it's about finding what suits you and your learning style and, and your personality um to get the best out of the people around you to make you better anybody else got any any questions they want to ask What would you call? What would you call your greatest achievement so far, Gav? In footy? Yeah, as in refereeing. Um, as refereeing alone. Yeah, um, it's a hard one because, um, yeah, like I said, I, I don't base my career on on appointments, so it wouldn't be around appointments. I think my greatest achievement is my longevity. Like I spoke about a little bit before, the the fact that you know I I came into the NRL squad in 2000. I think I ran my first touchline in 2002. So I think I started training there in 2001. Um, it's probably people on this call that weren't even born there. Uh, and, and I'm still there, you know, and I'm still putting boundaries and I'm still, you know, pushing others and I'm still, I'm still learning. You know, I mean, I haven't got to a point where I think I'm too, you know, I know too much or, or you know, I'm better than anything, anyone else. I'm at a point where, you know, I, I, st- I still learn every day. Um, on the flip side of that, you spoke a little bit. You spoke earlier about my coaching, and that I'm the coach of the junior rep squad. I get a lot of satisfaction out of that role. I get a, a lot of pride and a lot of ple- pleasure out of seeing, yeah, you know, being able to impart things that I've learned along the way and off, uh, off referees and, and coaches I've learned, and then giving it back and putting it back and seeing these young referees. I've been doing it. I think this is my fourth year there, and seeing these young referees start to flourish and. You know, and become better because of my input to them. I think that's, you know, I think down the track that'll probably be my greatest achievement. So while you're talking about on-field achievements, how did you adjust from being a one referee to now a pocket referee style? Obviously now yeah, obviously um, you're in the pocket, obviously full time now. But how did how did you adjust originally to obviously where you are now? Yeah, it's pretty topical at the minute, isn't it? One ref, two ref. Um, yeah, so obviously I, I, I'm one of the few, probably myself, Matt Checken, Benny Cummins and Jerry Sutton maybe, that have refereed first grade at, um, with one ref. Um, and that's a, a, a growing up, we all refereeing out there and referee to that. 
um, 2009 with two refs and I was actually the game was on yesterday on Fox on one of their old games so I refereed the first ever two ref game me and Shane Hay. Um and I with no the beard. year before that yeah <laughs> the, uh, the year before that I did a little bit in the 20s at the back end of the season we trialled it um, and so I sort of had a fair bit of experience before anyone else with, with the two ref system and it's evolved you know since 2009 to what it is today but when we first started, it was a bit of a split role and, and there wasn't sort of head refs and assist refs and that. <laughs> Someone dying in the background? Yeah, sound that way. <laughs> yeah. And then um, uh, two years ago, I think it was, because I you know, obviously uh, was, was one of the lead refs for, for a fairly long time. And then two year, years ago, a bit of it was around my experience and a bit of it was around keeping me in the game a little bit longer where they put me as an assist ref and I ran a lot of games with the young, inexperienced head referees, so guys that were making their debut as head refs and, and stuff like that. And it's about my experience and my rapport with players and, and the way I could sort of pull them out of a hole if they needed to or give them enough rope to let them learn. And, and so that sort of evolved from there. Um, the adjustment, you know, I mean, I think in refereeing, I, I think the, the better referees, the, the, the bigger skill set is their ability to adjust on the run. And I tell a story about the first ever um, Auckland Nines. So as a referees group, we went over there. I think the comp started on a Friday night. I think we got there Wednesday. I think Thursday night at about midnight, we got the rules. And involved in those rules were, it went from six tackles to four tackles. Uh, was the zero tackle from the 20 meter restart. Uh, there was free plays. There was like six new rules that we had to learn in less than 24 hours. Um, and we worked as a group to how we were going to do that best. And I don't think anyone would have known if we stuffed any of them up on that weekend because I think we're pretty good at it um, straight off the bat. And I think that's the reason why we're first grade referees is our ability to adjust on the run. At the NRL level, um, you know, we get told new interpretations, new rulings mid-season sometimes, and we have to adjust to that. With it, you know, same thing, at might, we might get told on a Wednesday, we're going to do this on a, on a Friday night. And your ability to be able to adjust to that is the reason why that um, we are where we are. Anybody else got any questions I'd like to ask? Ask me sure. questions. I love talking about myself. Troy, sure, there's someone out there. Yeah, I got one. Hey, um, Gav, what's your what's your secret around resilience? Like, you know, being a referee, you have to be resilient. What's your what's your <laughs> secret around? <laughs> What's your secret around, you know, being resilient and bouncing back from when things go air show? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think for me, I just don't take myself too seriously. <laughs> you know, I mean, if, if, if I don't take myself, if I, I, I don't have this, I don't put myself on this pedestal, I don't think that I'm better than anybody else or I do anything better than anything else. Um, when people can say what they want about me. And there's only a couple of people that I care about, their opinion. You know what I mean? I, my, my family and my boss you know really anyone else it's just an opinion and we've all got them and we're all out to have them and i have opinions on you know I'm, I'm a big sport fan as well and i watch sports and i have opinions on, on on what happens um but in that sport my opinion means nothing so um it's about that it's just not taking myself too seriously like i'm pretty big on social media i, I love social media and i get absolutely hammered on there and some of the stuff i get sent but um there's other guys that, that aren't like that you know what i mean and, and, and they don't have social media they won't read the papers they don't watch the news because you know they are they're, they're, the resilient factor is is massive, especially what we do. Um, there's not too many sports in the world where you know, I don't think, and like I said, I watch a lot of sports where people can rattle off the officials' names, pretty much you know all, all the referees. So for some reason, our media decide that they they want to hammer us more than any other sport. I don't know any other sport that gets you know I watch a lot of um, NFL, like, you know English Premier League, it could be NBA, and the attacks on, you know, on the officials in that aren't as personal as they are with us. So I get, I get why some referees find it a lot harder. But you know, for me, end of the day, I, I run up and down a park and blow a whistle and I get paid reasonably well to do it. Um, if that means I've got to take a little bit of abuse, give it to me every day. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I, same thing. It's like everything's personal for me. Like, I, I, water off a duck's back to me. I've, co I've copped a lot worse in my life than someone having a shot. On you, man. Anybody else got any questions? 
Yeah, Gavin, yeah, Paul Ease here. What advice can you give um, new referees who are picking up a whistle for the first time in terms of setting their expectations? Because I know we've got a lot, lot of young kids, a lot of good young kids, probably think they're going to stroll straight on into grand finals and things like that. And so I just, for, from your point of view, probably be good to hear um, at your level what kind of expectations they should be setting themselves. Yeah, I, I, I wish modern day me could tell when I first started me this piece of information because it would have made my career so much more enjoyable all the way throughout. And it's probably the last five or six years where I've sort of had this philosophy where I don't have any expectations. I just don't have expectations on, on, on any, I, all I can, I, I have this saying, and a lot of people in refereeing have it now, it's around control the controllables. There's a couple of things I can control in my career. I can control how fit I am, how dedicated I am to it. I control how knowledgeable I am around the laws and stuff like that. Apart from that, I can, I can tr control my character. I control who I am and what I do. Yeah, I mean, so if, if I control all those things and I go out there and, and just continually do that and do that, end of the day, if I don't get what I think I should, it's, it's, it is what it is. It's because someone didn't choose me. So the, when, you know, like we all do, and I get no doubt, and I know I did it, you know, you get caught up in, I'm the better, I think I'm a better referee than this person. Why did that person get that game? That's not going to help anything because it's someone's it's subject. It's someone else's decision. Someone who's been put in a position to make a decision has just made a decision. <laughs> I know as a coach, the hard, like I love coaching referees. I love imparting knowledge and doing all that. I wish I never had to do appointments. It's the hardest thing as a, as a, you know, as an administrator, as a coach to do. Because I need to separate people that I know have ability and give one a game and one not, give one a grand final, one not, that I know that both could do it equally well, but I can't put them both out there. So I've got to make decisions based on my personal feelings. And as a coach, you know, I make decisions based on what I like. So when I make my decisions in the junior rep squad on grand finals, obviously um, with you know, consultation with the rest of the coaching group, but... At the end of the day, I make decisions based on styles that I like, referees that I like, you know. So to then think that, oh, my world's upside down because I didn't get this appointment, it, it, nine times out of ten, if you just through pure luck that you got it or you didn't get an appointment. And we talk about it in our squad around Origins and Grand Finals and say you could put anyone of our squad, even some of the referees that haven't refereed first grade yet, into the big games week in, week out, and they would do them quite easily and referee them really well. Um, you can't, though. So someone's going to be disappointed, someone's going to be happy. So for me, like I said, if you can control the controllables and just enjoy, I've missed out on a lot of enjoyment over 350 games. There's a lot of games and a lot of times throughout my career where I was down because I didn't think I was getting what I should have gotten, where when I look back on it and I think, I was getting paid to do this. And you know, as a full-time job, I, I class it as like being at school. I get given a roster every week, virtually like my timetable, where I've got to be, what my training sessions are. I get to hang out with my mates all day. And then on the weekends, I've got footy. And I think about how much time I wasted worrying about appointments and getting upset over appointments. When at the end of the day, yeah, I have no control over that. So, yeah, if you just control the controllables and be ready if the opportunity comes. And, yeah, when, when I look at goal setting and I, I work with, with young referees around goal setting, I... I, I, I never set it around particular games or getting appointments. It's more around, you know, where I want to be in six weeks' time, whether it be physical, whether it be my knowledge of the laws uh, and, and how I'm going to get to that point. How am I going to get better? Not what game am I going to get? So if, if, if I had that philosophy when I first started refereeing, I reckon, um, you know, I would have had much more enjoyable length of a career, yeah. Anybody else got any questions? If I can go for one. Rob. Um, basically, in, I would have said early days, and I think Jeff Whitten from the country, if you know, probably... I know, Jeff, yep. Uh, along the lines of, you know, refereeing is a craft, not a science. It looks like more recently, with this horrible push for consistency, we've seen a bunch of KPIs that's given you guys that runs for pages and pages. The methodology and all this has come in. Looks like it's trying to move it to a science. 
how much room do you think there still is for the, the feel for the game intuition gut instinct in, in refereeing particularly at your nrl level yeah um to be totally honest um not a lot not at the nrl level um it's hard because i don't want to sit here and, and bag the nrl because it's a product and it's it's entertainment um so what, as referees we are told to do stuff that we don't like that goes against every grain of our refereeing salt you know what i mean and it gets frustrating and and but end of the day um we get paid decent amount um if your boss tells you if you're at work and your boss tells you to do something you can't do it um we have two options you say no i'm not doing it and you give it away or you think i'm gonna knuckle down i'm gonna do this and i'm gonna get it done um there's still a little bit of scope um and and this and it goes on for us what the game wants at this particular time where well, you go back two years ago and we blew 25 penalties a game because the game wanted us to you know sort of hammer the rucks and get uh, and get some compliance in the rucks but then we go the reason the rucks were so bad was because for so long we just let them get to that because at stages it was like we don't want any penalties so just let them do what they want so at that level that and that's what happens and we we sort of think we're going all right in one way and then because it is full-time professional and the coaches are always looking for an edge they're going to try and manipulate everything we do whether it be good or bad so at the nrl level um your scope for being a natural let it go like a mat check in style of referee is very very hard but you have to have that to get to there if that makes sense like you're not going to make it to that level through all the grades if that's not what you have and then i and then i talk about once you get there then you've got to be adaptable you've got to do sort of things that sometimes you don't agree with and it's the same when i coach there's you know I, I, you spoke about the methodology i'm a fan of the methodology i think the methodology is good because it gives coaches across the country something to coach to it gives us an opportunity to be consistent in our coaching across the game which we've never had um so i i, I am a fa- I keep kpis and stuff is a little bit different but methodology i am a fan of um and like i said it gives me especially when i go out looking for talent as well because i can judge okay it's you know and you know great back in you know in, in the day different areas coach differently and did different things whether you come from country whether you come from queensland whether you come from from city from new south wales so now we don't sort of have that so when i go we go and look at talented referees whether it be for our development squads whether it be for the junior reps whether it be for grade or whatever um we can judge a little bit better so and i think that works and i think we we should lean on that more at the nrl level around methodology more than kpis because then um that would give us a bit of feedback and the old you know sean hampstead and the you know matt check and style of, of referee sean hampstead and Ringo, he was the most uh, yeah teddy you know um yeah it's 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 unfortunate but that's that's a refereeing at an elite level and i'm sure players you speak to players and they play way too way more structured than they would when they were coming through and you know they enjoy playing as structures as they have to but at that level when you're playing for the big bucks that's what's expected hope that answers your question just on a lighter side gav what would be one of the funniest things you've either heard or seen on the footy field um there's been quite a few i remember referring a trial in uh wollongong um wayne bartram was playing and wayne bartram was mad a lot, a lot of young kids wouldn't know who wayne bartram is but and he was talking to himself the whole game and some of the stuff he was saying to himself was i probably couldn't repeat on here but he was just mad and every time i looked at him i just laughed because he would just say crazy stuff um it was pretty funny um i've got a little bit of a story in my debut game in brisbane um i've got absolutely poleaxed by carl webb who was running around to score a try and those who don't know carl webb he was probably 110 kilo front roller played for the broncos and played for queensland and australia and was absolutely mad as well and he was running around to score a try i was standing sort of 10 meters in front of me thinking he's just going to put the ball down and he decided he was going to run over the top of me and i have no doubt he just wanted to run over the top of me that was for no other reason he saw me standing there thought i'm going to get him and he just put me on my backside and i did a few flips and jumped up laughing and as i was walking back gordon tallis who was the captain of the broncos walked up to me and said badge if you're going to tackle webby you've got to go low um so and, and actually gave me a high five and then i had people 
um, contacted the NRL asking for me to be sacked because I was high fiving Brisbane Broncos players in a game. So, um, yeah, that was that was that was pretty cool. But there's been quite there's, there's hate, especially with two refs out in the field. Now we can have a bit of a joke with each other and have a bit of a laugh. And um, I wish we could take the microphones off us sometimes so we could say a little bit more back to players that we, yeah, but we can't. Who would be probably the hardest player to deal with over the time? Hardest to put, deal with? I think the hardest and my most favourite player to referee was uh, Michael Ennis. He was, I, I loved refereeing but because you knew you were up for a challenge. You knew you had to be on your game, which meant you, know, you always had to be you know, on, on top of your game. And I had a couple of really good runners with Mick and um, yeah, you always kept you on your toes. Yeah, you, you knew you had to be very careful every word you said because he would challenge what you said. If you, yeah, if you said the wrong thing or threw the wrong word in there, he, he'd attack it. So he was pretty smart. He, yeah, people call him the, you know, say he was a grub and stuff like that, but he was just really good, really good. Anybody else got any questions? Sure, there's somebody else. Gav, did you enjoy doing all the All-Stars games you've done? Because is it like a different atmosphere at those games? Yeah, it, well, actually funny, we talk about that. They are probably the biggest, the, the proudest moments of my career. Um, refereeing that, I refereed the first ever All-Star game um, and just hanging out with Preston that week and I've built up a, you know, a, a, a pretty good relationship with Preston now. And yeah, just hanging and just being part of that was, was pretty cool. Um, even like Indigenous rounds, so this year for Indigenous round at the NRL, I got to um, help design our jersey, so I've got my totem. Um, it was on the back of the jersey, um, and, and, and having that on there, and you know, that made me really proud. And being able to represent, you know, and myself but my family um, for that weekend. Um, so yeah, they're probably actually the question. You know, they're probably probably some of the proudest moments. So this year, Casey referee, my wife Casey referee the women's all star game. So I went up to Gold Coast and what's that? And just sitting in the crowd. And just being part of that is it's it's amazing, and they are, they are that is that's that's rugby league. That's what rugby league's about. Those games, and I think it adds a lot more now that it's you know not just a, a Mickey Mouse game where we play against a, a group of NRL players, where it actually means something between the Australians and the and the Maori players, so, um, and the camaraderie between those two after the game, being in the rooms and and sort of hanging out and having a chat and having it you know with, with the boys about it, and in in the week leading up, it's. Yeah, they're special times, Bell. Special times. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, Gav, I've just got a question about um, referees' confidence. Um, there's like four sets of eyes on the on the field. Um, do referees not have the same amount of confidence as they did 20 years ago when awarding tries and needing to rely on the bunker too much? Uh, no, I actually think it's the opposite. I reckon our confidence levels are super high. Um, the issue we have is you, 20 years ago, they didn't have super slow-mo replay. If there's no super slow-mo replay, and there's, you know, I, I speak about this a, a lot, and, and without disrespecting referees before because you know they, they had their... Um, their, their battles and, and, and their issues around refereeing the game was, you know, it was almost like a, you know, a, a brawl in a game of footy erupted around it and, you know, competitive scrums that I don't have to deal with, which I'm glad I don't because they look like a nightmare. And, you know, and they had their tough issues to deal with. Um, our ones are more around scrutiny. They didn't have every game on TV week in, week out. So, you know, you've got one or two games. They had f four cameras mapped at a game, no super slow-mo, no seven... TV shows through the week to then scrutinise every decision you made. No, you know, six talkback radio stations over the weekend talking about rugby league and through the week around the decisions you made. So they didn't have the same scrutiny around that. So if they made one or two errors here or there, no one cared, especially the games that weren't televised, no one knew. So we're more reliant to check it more as in you need to cover your ass because the time that you don't and it's dropped from something that, or there's a, an issue in there that you cannot pick up with the human eye, which happens to us, um, and then it's shown in super slow, super slow mode, and then we're hammered in the papers for a week. For the fact that we've got a backup, we take it. Um, it's about for us. It's about protecting our ass because it's there, um, not because we need. It, it's because it's there. I'm telling you, ninety nine point nine percent of the times when we check a try, we know what the result's going to be. 
I know whether that uh, yeah generally um, you see when we get some overturns um, and they're based around when we send decisions up at speaking out of school a little bit here we we, we take um, a lot of factors in a in, in the play sometimes we'll send something up thinking oh it's probably uh, it's probably no problem but we'll send up as a try hoping that they can find something to, to, to give it um, so you know especially around obstructions and stuff we send a lot of obstructions up as try when we're probably thinking it's going to be no try but if there's any any way that we can give it because um, you know we, we want it to be a try where we can but apart from that I, I think confidence from the current group that I'm involved with or since I've been involved in, is, is super high. It's just the fact that um, the media will kill us. We just get burnt and it, it's trial by media. I've been dropped from first grade because of comments that media have made. You know, and then because then that can continue throughout the week and then it becomes a, an issue that you see exactly the same thing happen in other games, but media didn't pick up on it and it's no issue. So yeah, it can. It can. Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's any issue with confidence in our sport. Probably too much confidence in some cases. I'm probably overconfident. All right, thanks. Not too easy. Gav, while you're talking about that, is there a reason why referees have to say try or no try? Can't you just say, okay, checking it for obstruction, and then obviously it goes back to the bunker then to decide? Um, yeah, we did. Well, the reason we don't do that is because when we did have that option and it came back ref's call, everyone would say, well, what's the use to checking it? The ref got the decision anyway. You know what I mean? Like, it, the ref's got to come back and make the decision anyway. So I think it was under Daniel Anderson. It was a couple of years ago where we went to well, give a decision. So if the, if the bunker can't come to a decision, then just go with the decision you made because you're in the best spot, especially around groundings. Main, it's mainly around groundings. Um, but it gives that's what what the ref's life decision is is your benefit of the doubt. That sort of takes that which is in the rule book. So, um, yeah, we're saying you know what I need this check. If if you don't have a decision on this, this is what it's going to be. It's like those ones where you, 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 we all we've all been in situations where we've given a trial where we have no idea if the ball's grounded or not, but we have a massive assumption that it is, so we we give the try. But um, it's similar to our life decision on some of them. It also gives the bunker a starting point of what they're looking for. Anybody else got any questions? No. Is that someone going to speak then? <laughs> any girls got any comments or questions? No? Going once? That might be it, Gav. Too easy. I just want to thank you again for your time tonight. Um, your insight to um, all the things you talked about is obviously greatly appreciated. And obviously your busy schedule, mate. So I just, just want to thank you for your time. And um, wish you all the best for the season. Yeah, thank everyone for, for jumping on. And um, hopefully, if we get the chance, I'll get down and have a look at a few and um, yeah, get out to a couple of games down there. Yeah, especially um, Enjoy. coaching you're doing with junior reps. Mate, there's plenty in yeah, uh, yeah. Group 7 and Group 16 that are worthy to be, uh, to be looked at. There's a couple we've already got our eye on, don't worry. I'm sure. Thanks again, mate. And um, Too easy, Rob. for the rest of your crew, uh, I'll liaise with the next fortnight's topics and we'll um, go from there. So thanks again, Gav. Really appreciate it, mate. Too easy. See you guys. Enjoy.